What's up everyone, welcome back to Workshop Rebuild. In today's episode, I'll focus on the John Deere 855 and as you may notice, all the green panels have been removed off this compact tractor. I got a lot of work done behind the scenes. I also went through the whole wiring harness which is over there on that table and later on in the video, I'll go over to this table over here and share with you guys the fuel sender. So if you guys are interested in that, stick around. What I have right in front of me is the base frame assembly on the John Deere 855. We have the two front wheels over here and the two back wheels over there. It is very clean. I took it out and gave it a good pressure wash and I covered up some of the important things like over here for the oil cooler, I covered everything up with a plastic bag so no water will go into those hard lines. And over here, I also uh, covered up some of the wiring um, so no water will get into that connector. But I will point out this gray part right here is the hydraulic motor and slash pump of this assembly. This is a Sundstrand Series 17, so this is a little bit bigger and it can handle a little bit more horsepower than a Sundstrand Series 15, which I rebuilt in the past. Now looking down below, we have our drive shaft right here. I will have to remove that in the near future because I noticed the main seal on this hydraulic motor is leaking. So I will be replacing that. If you guys wanna see me replace that seal, stick around for upcoming videos. Moving on to the back of the tractor, we have our transmission housing, which cuts off on this height. And we have our axle off to the left and off to the right over there. Above the transmission and a little bit above the hydraulic motor, which is right here, we have our control block. Um, this will power all our hydraulics on this tractor. So we have four lines going out from the top of this block and they will power our auxiliary hydraulics, which go to the left of this tractor, which are right down there. Um, I might actually take those apart in the near future as well and replace some of those O-rings. Now on the back end, we also have a bunch of linkages, which hook up to our forward and reverse. I noticed there is a little bit of play right in our forward pedal and also a little bit of play in our reverse. Um, obviously we have a pivoted point right here, but all those linkages go to the back. So our reverse is hooked up to this linkage right here and you will notice a bunch of play right there. I know I'm not giving this tractor a full restoration or a rebuild like I did to other tractors in the past, but I would like to address those little details so I have a good functioning tractor in the near future. On the front of this tractor, you will notice everything cleaned up very nicely. Around the radiator and the fuel tank, we had a bunch of buildup in this area, especially right down in this pan. Uh, this is where the bottom of the fuel tank sits, and this was just full of debris. And as you guys notice, in a previous video, I scraped this all out, but this is now a cleaned out 855 front end, and I could reassemble everything. Now looking at the front axle from the top, you will also notice everything has been cleaned up very nicely. I did notice on this front boot around the drive shaft for our front wheel assist, uh, there was a little bit of oil underneath. So I might have to take this front boot off as well as the back boot, which is right down there somewhere. Uh, and I will slide it back and see if that seal is still in good condition. If not, I will have to replace it. Same with the one towards the back. So I shared with you guys the John Deere 855, which is back there and it's all black, but the John Deere had all these green panels mounted to it and I laid everything out the way it came off the tractor. So as you will see, we have two fenders, which are covering our tires for safety, obviously. And down below we have our seat spring mechanism. Um, on this, we also have our seat switch. Our seat mounts on top of that. Then further down below, we have a couple of panels which cover the instrumental panel area. Right there, we will have our dash. On this cover, we also have the adjustment for our mower deck. Left and right, we have both foot pads. And further up front, we will also have our grill. I did not straighten that out just yet. Uh, I will be doing that with a piece of wood and a hammer. So something very simple, but the grill will look much better once it's straightened out. And this black part right here is the hood support. In the middle of the shop, I shared with you guys all the green panels that came off the John Deere 855. But over here on this little table, I have the main wiring harness. And I also have two smaller parts of the wiring harness, which will be on each fender. So this will allow us to illuminate our front and our tail lights on the fender itself. Then we have our amber uh, flashing light 
On this tract, I only had one of them, so I will have to see if I can find another one or just find two replacement lights. Over here on the table to the right, I have the main wiring harness. So I went through this wiring harness uh, the other night. I've already done some wiring harnesses in the past and I shared with you guys how I revived them. So this was one of the best wiring harnesses I've worked on yet. And I've had a look at the fuses right off the bat and everything seemed to be in good condition. Even the fuses were still good. So I went through the rest of the wiring harnesses all the way up to the ignition switch. Everything was good over here. Sometimes uh, over time, the ignition switch will um, corrode internally and then you will be missing a certain position for your ignition switch. Uh, and it's not even due to the wires. It's just on the inside, uh, there might be some buildup or even some corrosion. So that was actually still good. I fixed this up. This is the relay for the flashers. And uh, the plastic was a little bit broken, but I uh, glued that back together. But since it was cracked, there was a bunch of dust in here. So I removed this cap and I cleaned that all out and I made it work again. And that's really helpful. Uh, all the other wires are straightforward. Like this one is for the oil pressure switch. Um, that's also another thing I did when I go through the wiring harness, I just mark everything. So when I just put it back together, everything is very easy. And then I just rip all these pieces of tape off. Like this one right here is for the headlight. And down below, these two connectors are for our fuel sender. And that brings me to the next table, which is over there. When I removed the radiator and the oil cooler, the fuel tank was completely dirty. It is still dirty on the outside. I didn't really put much effort into cleaning it just yet. On top of the fuel tank, we also have our fuel sender, which is also our fuel pickup. Uh, it'll also tell our fuel gauge what level of fuel we have in our fuel tank, and that has to work as well. So my main focus is the inside of the fuel tank. Since I already sent this engine off to be rebuilt, I want to have clean fuel. So that means my whole fuel system has to be clean and that starts with the fuel tank. So I will give you guys a close up view on the inside of this fuel tank and I'll share with you guys the debris inside of here. And then I'll bring you guys over to this table and share with you guys the fuel sender. I'll give you guys a close up view on the inside of this fuel tank. There's not much debris down there to be honest, but it is not just fuel. There could be a little bit of water down in there as well, but there is some kind of sludge. It's not necessarily like a debris, um, if it were to be sand or something, but it is a slow moving sludge and that is obviously not diesel fuel. I don't know if you guys can see that perfectly, but I'm not really happy with that. So I'm gonna have to clean this out. I will clean out that fuel tank with some water and some pressure washer degreaser. Once everything is flushed, I will rinse it multiple times with water until it's very clean. After rinsing it out, there's probably still a little bit of water in there and I'm gonna just leave the fuel tank upside down for a couple of days and it'll probably be dry by the time I need it again. But now let me share with you guys the fuel sender on the bench over here. I have the fuel sender unit right in front of me on this table that is actually only this portion of it. And the rest is our pickup line for our fuel. And our return line is the shorter line on this assembly. On our pickup line, I removed the filter. It has a little screen on the end and it has a little piece of tube. Uh, it is a little bit harder than I want it to be. So I'm going to be replacing this tube in the near future. And I will blow some air in from this side and make sure that this screen is perfectly clean. As you guys will notice, it is very clean already. So that means there was not much debris, or at least this screen was not going all the way to the bottom to pick up any debris. So I will put this on once I have a brand new piece of tube. Now, when we look at this assembly here, I'm gonna focus on the fuel sender unit itself. So right over here, we have two wires going to the top. These two wires will then be hooked up to our wiring harness, and that will also send a signal to our fuel gauge, and that will allow us to determine the level of fuel we have in our fuel tank. This little assembly is very important and this might cause an issue to some of you out there. Um, this can go bad over time, obviously, if it's going up and down too many times or it even could corrode if there's no fuel in your fuel tank. Right now, I'm gonna give you guys a close-up view on this. I'm gonna activate the flow and raise it up a little bit. And you guys will notice right through this slot um, there are a bunch of little wires spanning from left to right and the wires are arranged in lines from top to bottom. So our lowest line will be right here. 
And as you will see, there are a bunch of little pieces of wire down there. And as I raise the float right here, that little tab will touch on all those little lines and raise past and go to our highest level in that position right there. You will see there's a little bit of wear right down there because it always makes the same motion. It only makes a quarter of a turn. So if your fuel sender has a good float, it's doing the exact same range as this one is right here. And all those little wires on the fuel sender itself look like they're in good condition. The next step is to take your multimeter and check if it's sending a signal. We're gonna take both leads of the multimeter and hook them up to these connectors of the fuel sender. As you will see, these two wires are dangling down and going to our fuel sender. You also wanna make sure that these wires are in good condition and that the connectors are still connected to have a good reading. I'm gonna put these two leads on these two connectors and I'm gonna set the multimeter to 2K ohms and we're gonna check the system for resistance and we're gonna start from the lowest setting and we're gonna move it up and we're gonna have a look at the reading. I'm going to grab both leads, put them on both connectors and you will see right away our resistance has jumped to four ohms right there it is on the lowest setting, so I believe it starts at around zero, or right now we have four, so that's very close. And now I'm going to slowly raise the float, and I wanna just raise it slowly, because as I mentioned before, that little tab must touch on all those little wires, and that will give us a greater value in resistance, and that will also send a different reading to our fuel gauge. So as we raise it very slowly, we will also notice that all the numbers, all the numbers start to rise. There is no jumping in those numbers whatsoever. If the number would go to zero as we're raising it, there might be an issue with your fuel sender, but you will notice we're gonna go up. It's at 70, 80, 90. There's no jump really, it's just, counting up very nicely and I'm not sure where this is going to end at but it looks like the maximum is at 175 if I put a little bit of pressure on, my, uh, on it with my finger so the range of this fuel sender is around 0 to 175 ohms and um, I didn't see any jump in reading so I can assume this fuel sender is still in good condition like I mentioned before if you guys have jumps, so if you guys will not see 150 or 120 for some reason, that will mean your fuel sender is in bad condition, possibly that your, your wires are not connected properly, or even your multimeter is not good. But I would check your fuel sender first. So I gave you guys a little update on the John Deere 855, what parts I removed, what I did with the wiring harness, and how I check the fuel tank and the fuel sender. If you'd like to see me rebuild this John Deere 855 engine, don't forget to hit that subscribe button down below if you haven't already, and turn on your post notifications because then you will be one of the first to see upcoming videos. And if you guys enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit that like button down below as well. It really helps me out with algorithm, but it also gives me great feedback if you guys are enjoying the content I share with you guys. So stay tuned for upcoming videos.